Great. Well, thanks for the organizers for, for inviting me to give this talk. Um, what I'm going to present today is sort of uh, an ongoing effort where I've been involved with and under the umbrella of Jefferson Angular, Convention Collaboration, etc. Where our idea essentially is to have sort of a consistent uh, framework where we can uh, put all the assumptions, all the, um, all the bugs that course can have on the same footing. Um, same running coupling, same techniques to do uh, the lag resolution, and extract sort of simultaneously all the pattern densities, polarized, unpolarized, and fragmentation functions, um, which I think, I'm not saying that this is the best thing ever to do. I think it's sort of a complementary thing that one can do with existing you know, work. So that's sort of the method that I want to get. So if you view this as a complementary thing across the world efforts. Um, so, okay, so part of the motivations is that, um, well, since I am sitting at JLab, well, there will be new challenges in interpreting this data, especially the semi-inclusive EIS, which is sort of the most important quantities to understand the structure there. But there are important questions that are sort of still not well understood, like what are the actual quantitative limits where factorization theorems are applicable? In fact, I don't even know if this question makes sense to start with. I don't know how to address it, but we definitely need to go beyond this point where, roughly speaking, you know, Q squared has to be high-ish. What does high-ish mean? What does high X mean or low X mean? Right. Um, we also need to make sure that this is not group fitting, right? Because, you know, and then the only way to really test against group fitting is that we have a predictive power. And, and this is very important in, the, in the, these collinear distributions are very important also in studying PMDs because ultimately PMDs are another perturbative quantities described the inclusive CIA. So while we are used to this, see these nice pictures, like if you integrate PMDs, you get PDFs, to me that's sort of a connection, but rather formally we actually have TMDs as a one thing and collinear PDF is another thing. And so uh, the semi-inclusive observables require to use both of them. So we need to have the collinear distributions um, well under control. And the other aspect is that we, we really need to move on, or at least our idea is to formalize the data analysis using modern, modern techniques. Um, the reason is that if you actually go and look at any of the papers, let's say 50 years ago or so, uh, the method to address uncertainties, etc., are all based on high square. There is no mention whatsoever about global densities. And, and essentially, I would claim that, I mean, I don't, I don't have time to discuss this, but essentially all the analysis that we do is intrinsically a Bayesian likelihood analysis with some priors and a likelihood where you put the, the data and then ultimately all we do is try to characterize the probability distribution for the PDFs given the data. And then there are various techniques that one can use. So the traditional one is maximum likelihood plus Hessian. Uh, you can use the same thing with Lagrange like multipliers. But more recently from NMPDF, uh, the concept of bootstrapping or data resampling has been gaining more attention because it's, it's also a different way to assess uh, how to characterize the probability densities. And in, in this work, we basically start going to use these Monte Carlo methods, and, um, and then we, we sort of craft our own methodology within the Monte Carlo, which we call iterative Monte Carlo, which are published in our papers. And, and more recently, and, and, and by the way, the way to deal with this quality density is actually not unique. And I think uh, the idea is to actually use any method because the physics should not be should be independent of how, which method I use. So one of the goals that we also do is also to explore different methodologies. So one of the things that we also did was I started looking at is the so-called nested sampling, which is an algorithm that is being used in, in, uh, in, in cosmology to basically address the same questions, how to sample the parameter space 
of their unknowns. Okay, so for those who are not like really familiar with this, you know, uh, JAM or JAN um, analysis, I just want, want to give a brief history of sort of results that have been happening. Um, so around 2015, uh, with this, this sort of analysis only on polarized pattern densities, including all the 6 GV data, okay? So they, they, this include everything, okay? And so that means no W pad, is that correct? No, 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 there is a W pad, uh, okay. larger yeah. than... Um, okay. No, because you said all data so that can be different things. Okay. All okay. the 6 GB data that can be interpreted with the DB analysis app. Okay, cool. Uh, which includes, you know, some range around this. Yes. Um, and we put all the bells and whistles in connect, uh, in calculating the structure function theoretically, like uh, putting target mass corrections, putting the twist three part of the polar, or, or polar distribution. So here we see in yellow, uh, the, the various PDFs without the JLab data and after the JLab data, okay? And then one of the things that we found interesting was, for instance, that we could actually sort of get some constraints on the twist three part, which are here, okay? So without the JLab, it's, it's basically noise, but then you can start seeing some kind of uh, features appearing. And we also, also extract uh, the, the residual twist four, which were basically zero relative to the twist three part. And unfortunately, Matthias is not here. He was complaining on yet last week that somehow JLab is saying that the V2 matrix element is somehow negative. But you know, this is a, you know, a full analysis that shows, we think QCD, that shows that the V2 as a function of Q squared is positive for a proton and negative uh, for a neutron. And an interesting thing is that all of these experiments has measured the D2, the D2 matrix element are seeking the resonance region. And the fact that uh, our analysis somehow, might, so the, the, the jam is basically the one that is you know, in open boxes. So except for, I think, a uh, couple of situations like this, I think we find that basically it's consistent, which is very interesting because that shows that, you know, a DIS measurement in the in the uh, in the DIS region, right, can describe this D2 that was measured in the resonance region, which proves up to some extent that there is a higher duality. The duality somehow works in um, from this perspective at least. Okay, sorry for yes, so just for the two. Well, this the this DIS is just region and this one is the same in the resonance region. So what are the statements about? The statement is that these D2 were extracted from the resonant region. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, the, the, so uh, it, is it consistent with the one from lack of high energy? Right. So, these open dots are the ones that I get from really high energy DIS. And then, when I calculate the D2, they manage to become the same. So, it's sort of indicating empirically that there is a degree of 400 body. But have you checked other polynomials? Every polynomial is the same, or just this one has a just the D two. When you calculate D two, you have excluded the elastic. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, okay. the, the D two is only you know the yes. distribution that I got from empirically from from the DISP, and then I take I construct this quantity, right. and then I plot it here. But when you integrate one issue and how will you? Part of the variety is what you do with the elastic, which sits at one. Right. In the so you're not. So it's important to show, I think. And, and, and the answer is, you don't know. Yeah, I don't with know. The elastic. So, so it is important to have, you know, with the elastic, without the elastic. I think, I think the this data, this data does not include so the elastic. Okay. So yeah. it's only excluding only elastic events. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so then this, so let me just focus now on the collinear pattern densities that we got here. So essentially the U plus and P plus, Y plus, I mean U plus U bar, okay? They are basically consistent at some extent across all the uh, uh, lower analysis that exist, existed at that point. Uh, interestingly, 
even without having you know the, the jet data our gluon distribution were very similar to the DSS gluon distribution um, that was an interesting observation so actually this somehow demotivated me to include the jet data because I was like okay what am I going to let if I'm already getting something like this but Nevertheless, in future, we plan to include the data. I must say, I would like to challenge this because we have done studies, and we mean uh, a linear combination out of RIC and some of the PDF fitters uh, like NNPDF and PSSV. And if they don't include, and also earlier Bloomland Wöttcher measurements, if they don't include uh, the RIC data, Delta G, the uncertainty is how much. So there is a degree of bias due to the parameterization. That could be one possibility. Uh, the other thing is that in DSS, uh, there is, a, you know, the methodology is different because it's like branch multipliers with certain criteria on delta chi square. This is strictly speaking, the likelihood of one sigma from a Gaussian likelihood. So I, I, I would say that, you know, in, you know I, would, I would sort of tend to, believe that this might be underestimated. Okay. It's just that I think that, you know, we need to do apples and apples comparison. Yes, that's fine. Now, Elkin... It's not random, right? It's not an apples to apples comparison. You say compare PSSV and GEM. The error bars are not apples to apples comparison. But the central value somehow managed to be very close. But since, yeah, okay. <laughs> it seems unlikely that the constraint could be that good if we only have free data constraint. Right. So the elephant in the room for us was the strain distribution. And Elko already mentioned this issue. And the main point is that if you do inclusive, all the inclusive DIS analysis always get a negative distribution here. Uh, and then the only reason that this actually happens is because these SU3 constraints are imposed. If you don't put SU3 constraint, then there is no such thing as delta S because there, is, there are more unknowns than knowns. Okay? And so we try to, and, and, and since DSS has this very you know, characteristic shape where there is a sign change, we wanted to sort of explore what, what is the underlying reason and check more, you know, from our perspective, what, what, what is it? So essentially from our, our final D, uh, 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 analysis from Jan 15, we find that essentially DSS and ours are inconsistent. So we want to ask why that's the case. Uh, so, so around 2016, based on motivated by uh, uh, some work done by Elliot Dieter, we say that, well, essentially, it depends on fragmentation functions. What do you use? You will get a different answer. Uh, if you use HKNS, you get one type of answer for a strain. If you use DSS, you get another. That was the statement. And so we decided, well, why not we also study fragmentation functions you know, uh, ourselves too and try to combine the analysis all together. And interestingly, we, so, so of course, we have to start somewhere, which is basically repeating what people did, you know, within our framework, uh, and then we include all this, you know, Pion and Canyon uh, from E plus E minus, uh, all the way from Bell, Baba up to left energies. And what we found interestingly is that for the uh, Canyon, uh, uh, for the strange into Canyon fragmentation function, uh, you can see that essentially the jam uh, fits actually agree with DSS. So we were like in a puzzle again because okay so then how is the, so it's not a fragmentation function so we you know even 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 Kumano and here I was part of this analysis they approve it and essentially they agree that you know the DSS version was correct and so 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 okay still the puzzle remains because it's not about fragmentation functions and so on, in 2017, we basically decided to finally do the, combi the combined analysis of the polarized PDS and fragmentation functions. And, and, and what we found is that essentially the uncertainty is not, so in this analysis, since I'm including semi-inclusive PIS with Canyons, now I can remove the SU3 constraints. And if I do that, 
then the uncertainty on the strain distribution becomes as big as this. Okay? But in principle, I'm, I'm entitled to release, remove the SU3 constraint, and talk about those tests because I should have that unknown. It's just that the uncertainties in the dark are too large. Okay. Uh, okay, so I don't want to go into the details of, of the rest of distribution, but exact, uh, what I want to discuss a little bit is more about the strange. And the question is, what determine the sign of delta? That was our question. This slide is a little bit busy, but let me just explain. I will try to explain it. It's in our paper very carefully. So essentially, we consider three cases. One is, you know, take the you know, uh, inclusive DIS plus SU3. And we know that there is no sign chain, and this is the value of the first moment of the delta S. Now, this value is basically coming from SU3. Okay? That's the value that, because the up and the down is basically very well constrained from the protein and neutron data. So there is little room for this number, essentially, from the SU3 perspective. Okay? So what we did, what we, re what we realized is that basically there were some inclusive DIS compact data set that actually somehow in the small X region, tend to favor a very small uh, delta S. So essentially, the, you know, um, this, you know, if you look at this, uh, this band here, it wants to make this thing very small. But in order to create a minus 0.1, then you need to actually create a negative area here. And so that's how sort of the SU3 constraint tried to create a bias. But that was basically looking at, essentially due to some five points in the small X region, and of course, the next question was, okay, so what if I actually remove those five points sitting uh, 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 below 10 to the minus three-ish? And then uh, what we find is, I think, um, uh, hold on, the negative is considered by small. Oh, so we don't, we don't longer need, we don't longer, is this, is this version here, we don't really longer need to have a negative Delta S. So essentially, those five points essentially created this stuff here. Okay, so can I ask a question about this? Yeah, yeah or should not. I, should I do it now or what do you prefer? You want to move on? Maybe now. So okay, right. so what is the basis for removing five data points that are published? Our idea was to try to understand, you know, how the shape will try to create a negative. That, that was the, all, all, all our exercise. So, but one way of looking at that data is that it is rather unique EIS data that is given its position that gives us insight in the cross, the polarized cross section at smallest x. Right? Yes. We have no evidence that this data is all. Yes. You still describe the cross section there? Yes. So the only reason that I'm doing this exercise mm -hmm. is to show what is the interplay between the SU3 constraint and the wall data. How is that if you put the SU3 constraint and the wall data, you create a negative thing? I just wanted to understand that aspect. Okay. Now, if I remove the SU3, then what happens is that I can still have a negative, you know, a small delta S, but I don't longer need to have, you know, uh, a very negative thing because SV3 doesn't require it. I mean, it's not part of it. So, that, so essentially what I'm trying to say is that we place SU3 by cities, and then you basically have something that is almost consistent with zero, actually much more consistent with the SS. My impression was that those Compass data not only maybe favor the small data, but the negative data. Well. That's right. I think it was just very small. That's you know like very small delta is here. So if you want to suppress the delta is here, then if you have to create a negative to, to make sure that you get all kinds of. Well, I thought they maybe prefer the negative data. because the G one they see is very small or the A one is very small. That is the sum of ups and downs. So, and I think ups and downs are relatively small there, so in order to are relatively large still there. So if you want to get a delta S, I uh, mean zero A one N, A one photon, then you need some negative expansion. Mm. Well, okay. Isn't one of the main conclusions from this? Um, because I agree just to choose particularly five data points is not a 
isn't the thing again that we see the three F minus D is maybe not a good constraint for the, to put in for the DIS data and but that we need more data at lower X to really kind of absolutely. I'm just playing with the data. Exactly. No, no, <laughs> exactly. I think that supports against this, this right. type of uh, conclusion. Okay, and okay, so okay, that's all I want to say about this kind of those habits. Um, so some updates at that point. So here what you can see is that we basically, you know, uh, create a flat distribution for, let's say, um, actually, somehow we're going to see it. For GEA, for instance, uh, we didn't even include the, the SU2. I mean, we didn't impose the GEA. And then you can see that within two, more or less within 2%, uh, uh, there is a consistency with SU2. Okay. And then for, uh, for the octet, we can see that essentially the wall data try to prefer something smaller. But again, this is very wide. Yeah, still very, you know, last week, not so conclusive, right? So we, essentially that, that shows that you need to have much more data. So the, 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 the uh, GA, you're not constrained just Right. Fit. None of these quantities, we are not using any of these uh, 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 numbers at all, you know, just from the data, see this in inclusive EIS, what is, what's the values, this is what it is. So if we want to do, in future, if, you know, if EIC really wants to make, and including also JLab, you know, wants to make a point, you know, we need to get a precision of, you know, how, of this tiny error bands, right? But right now the error bands from the data is too large. It could be larger right? because that depends on the method, but you know, from our Monte Carlo analysis, this is how far we can get. Okay, uh, this plot was also shown by Weiwen. I don't want to say too much about that. The only thing that I want to say here is about the methodology. Uh, somehow, uh, somehow there, there has been a lot of controversies or maybe misinterpretation of the point of this paper. The point of this paper was that if you actually look at the GT value, uh, from semi-inclusive EIS, you basically don't know anything, um, you know, because you, you do a fit and then you might get stuck in a local minimum here, but if you actually look at the whole error, well, the error is much larger, so we really don't know anything. But can you actually put lattice QCD and be consistent with the, with the existing data? And the answer is yes. And so, uh, the, because existing analysis somehow suggests that there will be a tension, and in, if solid measures uh, 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 TMDs a um, higher precision, then we will end up with something like 10 sigma uh, uh, discrepancy. So that, that's kind of the, the expectation, but we can say that essentially at present, there is no indication of any discrepancy. Okay, so uh, in my reminding, how long uh, Okay. Uh, a bit more. Okay, so I'm going to show where where am I right now on this on this kind of analysis? So as I mentioned at the beginning, we wanted to do the full combined analysis where we put polarized PDFs, unpolarized PDFs, and fragmentation functions all together. Now this is preliminary, so you know don't don't throw me tomatoes. Um, uh, it's still it's still tomato. It, it, it's still it's still preliminary. <laughs> The logic here is that uh, it's a f the first step in, a, in all our analysis is to first try to do a maximizing analysis just to make sure that we actually can this, we actually can get a good high score to start with, you know, that we can actually get a reasonable uh, a pattern density is reasonable quote unquote. Um, and then if we actually get some good high squares, then the next step is to actually assess what are the uncertainties out of it. Um, as, a, as an interim, because I'm showing this in the conference, I actually showed this result also in SPIN 18 a uh, month ago. Um, we basically, the idea is that I do a maximum likelihood, this is just high square minimization, and once I have that fit, I start shuffling all the data Around, the, around their quarter and seventies and refit and refit and refit fit many times to see how stable is the fit that I got around that. And then that gives some insight of, you know, how uh, stable is the result that I'm getting. 
Uh, nevertheless, as I will sh show you later, the correct thing to do is to actually not to start from the best fit, but rather start from many different starting points. Make sure that I capture all the possible solutions. So the errors that I'm going to show here is just basically taking one single fit and sort of you know take the tail of the dog, you know, wiggle it and see how the mouse you know uh, will wiggle. That's sort of the, the logic here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so what I included here is all the uh, world-inclusive DIS data, including all the combined H1 and Zeus data, along with the semi-inclusive DIS from Compass. Unfortunately, the Hermes data, we still having tr some trouble. Um, so, um, and I'm not saying that it's inconsistent. I'm just saying that we still yeah, have yeah, trouble I know. figure I'm, out. I'm, I'm teasing you. Uh, we also included the Radian data because I think it's important to include Radian data to get the diva minus U bar right. And all the polarized DIS and, and cities along with the E plus E minus data. And the theory setup is up next to leading order in GQCD. And for this case, I'm restricting myself at the leading twist uh, uh, physics so that, you know, I don't, um, well, that means I'm restricting DIS with a W square cut 10 GEV better than 10 GEV, um, because uh, more lately I'm having more issues about how to interpret the high X data and all these concepts of target mass corrections are getting even more milky than I could before. So this is the theory setup. And roughly speaking, we have around 171 parameters because there are 20 parameters, each from pattern densities, another 20 for polarized, another 20 for ion fragmentation, another 20. And, so forth, and then there is normalization and certain different data. That more or less is 171 dimensional space that I need to do. I want to color something. Um, so this is the first step, again, okay, preliminary. Okay. So here is the result of, 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 of a fit as well as the data resampling. You know, you might think that this is one line. This is not one line. This is just basically the errors, you know, by you know, doing data resampling. It seems very small. Um, but that is expected because in, you know, these distributions are really, really well known. So this is the glue, this is the U balance, D balance, U band D bar, you can see the characteristic asymmetry. And here is the S and S bar that I can actually do because I have uh, seen series of occasions. Uh, I did not impose this to be equal, so essentially the data in the series region show the asymmetry. Now, this closing, by the way, is a constraint because I'm imposing the first moment of S minus S bar to be zero, no nice strangeness. Uh, whether that's a good thing to do is debatable, uh, but this is what I did. Okay? Um, and so just to put sort of a feeling of how is that this PDF that I got here compares to other groups, like MMHD, CP14, or CJ, or ABM, you can see that essentially the gluon distribution is pretty much well determined and I can get the same thing, except that there are for the D balance, there are some you know, spread around. You know, this is only the central values of the GDF. And the one that I got is basically passing by. You know. uh, for the D bar and U bar, same story, everyone gets the same thing. And then the main difference here is the strength distribution. Somehow in this particular analysis that I did, the strength distribution that I'm getting is much smaller than the nominal uh, 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 strength distribution that everyone gets. Again, preliminary. Okay, so you know, in an update analysis, I will show, you know, see whether this actually remains. But essentially, but still, even 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 here, we can start seeing sort of certain features, which I show you in the next slides. Can I ask one question? I mean, it's a stupid thing, but people say, sure, it doesn't look very much like S and S bar, which is way to say area. So. No, the moment is, is zero. Yeah, it doesn't look like that. That's what I'm saying. Okay, it's just zero. zero. It takes time to do for a log scale, which was correct. No, it's not. It's not x time. Oh, we show like no before. Oh, no, but the, but the moment is not x time, right? It's the balance. So it's just saying s minus s bar. Exactly. But if you put x times the distribution is one of x. Oh right, 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 right. 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 Uh, and that doesn't look like that. So then there's maybe the point of this crossing. Uh, there's another I, and this, this curve clearly sits about the um, darker curve for most of uh, yeah. the that part. Uh, maybe something happens here, I don't know. Uh, but 
numerically, I know that that thing goes to zero. Uh, but I can check. Okay. Um, so just looking at the same thing, but in terms of ratios, D by U bar. So our my analysis is sitting here. And the CT14 is basically very similar. And this shape is what CJ and MHD gets. <coughs> Uh, but this is basically the shape of D bar minus U bar. Now, as I said, the strength distribution is somehow suppressed relative to the other groups. Um, you know, again, preliminary, I don't know. I mean, if I start from, I want to find out this thing in a more robust way by studying. Can you ask one question to one yeah. of the other groups to that S plus S bar is basically like a K factor um, kappa times so, yeah. uh, U bar, kappa times U bar so, plus D bar. So that, of course, can uh, cause quite some. Uh, I, I forgot which ones are still using. So I, I CJ, which I know because I'm part of that stuff, yeah. is 0.4 by hand. Okay. In fact, to me, the strength distribution is, by the way, fiction. Okay, because mm -hmm. I can take in CJ set kappa to be zero, and there is no change whatsoever in the high square, like at all. So it's fiction. Um, if you um, don't have data which are really sensitive apart from the neutrino data to suspension. Well, nowadays we have the, uh, the, the, the W plus charm. If, if they are included, right. yes, but before, and not all of them have some included yet, I, I completely agree. Right. Yeah. So this is sort of hints of more or less what I'm getting. Again, you know, don't get too excited about the preliminary. Okay. Uh, anyway, so there is some asymmetry that somehow I can see from, from, from this analysis, uh, whatever that means. Um, okay, now moving into the polarized sector. Um, okay, as far as you know, the information of Delta G, you, you, that this is kind of uninteresting. But what is really interesting in this case, even though this is preliminary, is the size of the error bus from separating S and S bar. So if you look at the S, the, so this plot shows that S bar is really unconstrained. And then I showed before that the combined analysis of Jan 17 has a large error on delta S plus. So most of the error on delta, delta S plus actually comes from delta S bar. Okay. And I think that this is independent of where I start. It's just basically the stability that the data can offer for the delta S bar. We need to actually somehow have much better precise uh, K plus measurement, right? Because K plus CDs is U and S bar. And somehow I don't understand why at the moment that delta S is more precise, which will indicate that K minus is more precise than K plus. I don't know why. Maybe those are an experimental things, uh, but this is what I find. Maybe K plus is small by U plus because I'm just so big. So maybe K plus is better. Right, and also I think that since this is on deuterium, I think the charges can you know, affect this. Um, but essentially the message is that currently I think we need to have a better constraint on delta S bar, several people are sensitive to that. And that can in principle reduce the uncertainties on delta S plus and check the um, delta S. Okay, um, another plot that I can play with it is just basically these ratios, the ratio of delta U on U, uh, which for the aqua, it goes nicely to one as expected from zero hunting rules. And of course, no, at the moment, and I don't, I don't think this will go up. This is crazy if it goes up. But so far from the measure of uh, series data, we don't see this upturn yet, right? And this, in the, full, in the full combined analysis, we don't see it either. Um, so does that nicely work the one? It looks like it crosses one much like it. <laughs> um, I, mean, I know that always in the SSC we find that it does go to one really but I don't know if it's that. And with that little uncertainty, it would be. Oh, okay. So that's why, you know, hey, for, I will show another plot where I will convince that these errors might be meaningless. The only probably thing that I, to me is more meaningful is this difference. Mm. Because this is somehow independent on, on, on that methodology, is how stable it is. Uh, but let me just go to that slide where I'm, I'm heading. Uh, okay, so again, big errors from, for, 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 for the C, you know, essentially we need more data. 
Okay. Um, and the other thing that I play with it is just basically the individual felicity distributions, right? And um, uh, one particularity is that for all the antiquarks, this seems to be the same. Um, and for the U and the down, you know, this basically changes. Um, so this needs to happen so that we will get one, right? While for the down, this is not happening. So, yeah, who knows? Uh, okay, so maybe this is not that too important. You know, this is an update of the moment. Um, I don't want to build much in the But one thing that I try to do is, you know, how crazy is my delta G, you know, if I, even if I'm not in three in the, in the big data. And I just put up, you know, this is my prediction here. So this is sort of a genuine prediction, you know, using, you know, wall data except for, you know, uh, uh, Big data, which is okay, maybe not too bad, you know, um, if it's a prediction. And of course, you know, that means that I have to actually include the jet data to make sure that it will be more aligned with the rest of the world data. And the size of the star is a little bit. It's actually tiny, you know. I get, you know, it's, it's actually a tiny error, but again, that is because of the methodology. I just did one single fit, and then I just, you know, did the data resampling. That means that essentially uh, the picture is that if I look at the likelihood function, you know, I might have something like this, and I might be in some region that is maximum, and then I'm just wiggling around. But then I need to really you know, start from many places to make sure that I get to all these points, right? And then wiggle around to get a much broader uh, description of the, of the answer. Okay, we will hide this plot for quick. <laughs> but. Sorry. Okay, so again, you know, also I also did an update on the fragmentation group because I did a simultaneously fragmentation. And one of the things that is getting somehow clear to me is that the gluon distribution from the recent compass data uh, tends to be constrained. So in jam, in, in, in jam 16, the Kenyan gluon was basically noise to me, but now it's actually much constraints here. Okay, it picks a larger Z. And that also happens for the pions. And I would argue that you know, improving the gluon distribution in principle helps to understand better the CDS QT dependent data because that data really enters you know, the gluon fragmentation enters a leading order. So, okay, you will say, well, you haven't put the rig data and the more data. Yes, this is so far preliminary, okay? So, we are going to put more, but so far, if, you, if we do the analysis only on the low energy, this is basically what you get. I just keep need to put, I just have two hands to this myself, so, okay. Okay, uh, so, so, before I end, I just want to show you one slide which is what I'm doing right now, which is basically to try to start from everywhere, okay, to make sure how large our cancer is. And so, and by the way, here, I'm just showing something that does no, has no series yet, no fragmented, only the unpolarized GDS. And so, um, uh, the, the color label is, the blue is the cyan color, U balance is the red, the blue is D, uh, the green is the D bar, U bar, and the yellow is S and S bar. So, I start with flat priors, which means, by the way, uh, a flat parameter space does not translate into flat PDS space. And so just by eye, I try to tune sort of the ranges so that I more or less cover the known physics. And I would say, let me just be very, you know, cavalier here in putting a very wild uh, 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 shapes for the, for, the, for the C, okay? So I start from flat priors. And take each of the, each of each one of that each one of these priors, and then shuffle the data and then do a minimization, and then this is what I get here. Now, an interesting observation that I had is that uh, I get a gluon distribution that is very different if I include Hera. That sort of makes sense. Hera actually a small x constrained the group. I was actually surprised that no matter how how flexible I make the parameterization for the glue, the error bands never covers the error. That tells me that essentially um, 
there is certain tension essentially between the existing no HERA data versus HERA data. And that's, I think, one of the reasons that HERA PDFs said, well, we are going to use only HERA PDFs and not the whole data. And this is basically what is shown here. And so after I include the HERA data, it becomes like this. You know, without HERA, you don't have any separation between EVA and UVA. Uh, there is also nothing that you can learn from this range. If you include HERA, it starts stabilizing. And notice that in some papers of HERA, they said also that you know, the EVA was actually smaller than a UVA. You know, there are some solutions like that. But in reality, I think that if you explore the parameter space very thoroughly, you can start seeing that even with HERA, you can see the uh, um, EVA minus UVA symmetry. And finally, once I included the dry young data, you can you know, start seeing very careful things. So the strain distribution, notice how it goes, right? From very nothing up to here. Um, I would say that this is basically mostly due to the momentum sample. Right. Sorry, I mean, just finish this question. Another question about the group. All right, so your FG decreases its vortex. This is at the input scale, yeah. So input what scale is, in, input scale here is uh, map of the charm. And why should it be any different with the input scale as opposed to the input scale? No, if you, well, if you, if you, uh, so, so here, the gluon is evaluated, I think, at 100 GeV just to make sure that I can compare with the rest. And you can see that it goes up. But why should it not have a choose for it? Evolution? Yeah, we have a non-perturbative contribution. And how do we know that non-perturbative contribution gives XG that decreases in small x? Not, not decreases, it's just that is the, uh, the gluon which is uh, which is there, and then you kind of evolve to 100 GV and you get a lot of Gluons from radiation. No, that's I understand this what happens yeah. is more to the others in order the initial distribution should have that point. It fits it to the data. So I, I just right? my question is how, how dependent it is on your parameterization. So I modify it, you know, I actually added two, you know, I make this thing really flexible. There is actually two shapes uh, that goes there. The, the exponent of x to the alpha is varying, as you can yes, see here. You see, I'm using priors that are very, you know, wild, and you know, starting from any of these, the data will put it down here. So if you take just here, would you also get the same? Well, yeah, Hera data is basically direct driven this. I mean, so that one is dominant with the character. Yeah. So the shape here more or less goes like down, right? But then Hera wants in this region to go up. So you should scale again. MC. MC. See, that's that makes a big difference because if you, for example, decided to start at four or something, or you expect, then I'm sure your distribution would have to be already steeper because right. uh, you right, right, otherwise right. the test doesn't have time enough or contribution length enough to to do something really steep to so whatever was the that's what I'm saying. Even at the distribution of the rise of the You know that you could be fine so the SFT yeah. calculations if you want the cross section so it's all Yeah, yeah, but but it's it's uh yeah, you don't dominate it. So, so but the latest study from NNVDF with the Swiss summation, for example, which uh, um Jose gave a very nice talk at the poetic summarizing says. They also find that at uh, and they start putting in the data with a cut of uh, four or so, and they find that this peak, which is basically I call it a valence gluon, and let's not talk about this. That's a stupid name, I know. And then it is actually relatively flat for a long uh, range. That is actually fine. That is fine. So I, I, you, you can look to the latest of, paper. If you don't have any small x evolution at the lowest order, your distribution is. X, X times your distribution would be an X independent of small X. If you don't have any yeah. small X evolution, but to get a decrease with X, I just cannot think what physics can do it. Because, I mean, I understand what you did, I'm not criticizing it. It's kind of surprising. But isn't that part of what Hera got as well? That is that NLO? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 y
Yeah, yeah so Hera, Hera at one moment had negative, uh, relatively at lower x negative big gluons. Ah, so that's what you remember. Right. And then they now they they did or say the new data is much more stable. So I don't know was which uh, did you do the combined data? Yeah, combined. Okay, fine. Uh, so and then the three summation actually showed that this negative gluon is all completely gone. It is nicely so it has this poopy bumps and then it's more or less flat. And I don't know whether it goes slightly low. That we would have to look to the problem. Well, I guess what I would say then is, of course, when the gluon was negative, people were saying, oh, it could be an evidence of separation because you can. Uh, That's all gone. Yeah. Uh, well, no, but now you have that. That's not quite better. I'm sorry. I mean, if you give me some physics mechanism in which the gluon distribution would decrease at small x, x times g would decrease at small x, I would give you five bucks. That is not I'm just saying the only, no, no. the only way I could explain it is that here if his skin is very, not very large, so the data is not really all these inputs. It is factoring in high twist effects, which would be separation effects, or by forcing a leading twist field, and, and that's probably what happens. But you know, of course, I don't know for sure. It's just a yeah, and I think you have to compare it with some other fits and take it. But as I said, so the, the negative gluon in here is completely gone. I think the whole thing is, as I said, this is, may not be a better thing than the negative gluon. I mean, the whole thing is certainly a little tricky in the sense that if you have an input like that, you know, if you go one epsilon away from the input it's scale, it already difference. has to be yeah. steep, right? Because first by evolution, because the splitting function diverges, so you add a little bit to it, and the little bit that you add is divergent, actually. So, um, that means, in some sense, there is some issue with sensitivity uh, to the input scale, right? If I um, maybe put the value down even lower, it's really, you know. But well, the same often times in the polarized case, when, for example, our Q1 at high x goes like 1 minus x to 10 or something, right? If it do, does that, then the minute you crank up evolution, the valence will feed into that, and the valence is a much higher, lower power of 1 minus x, so uh, dominated by the valence, uh, plus an additional. So one could argue so that it may, it, I think what you're saying is not, um, that does not contradict to what I'm no, talking about. I mean, maybe it's like pushing the up into the region where it is way too sensitive to the initial condition and shouldn't be used in this area. Right? Interesting question. Yeah, yeah I've been thinking about this quite a few times, but it's, it's an interesting thing. Yeah, so we should run the block in the opposite direction. I'm sorry? And we run the block. Yeah, you can. And then the thing is, of course, if you run it backwards in some sense, then you, the splitting functions are still there. So it's going to remain singular, but then it has to turn negative because somehow it doesn't want to be steep anymore. But <laughs> because <laughs> negative, and that's what the people, why the, the reason why people found negative ones if they bought backwards already in the 90s. So maybe the solution is never show anything at the input scale, but something important. That's the thing, exactly. Okay. Right. <laughs> 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 I think you're doing it too, but it's not the same. 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 Otherwise, you get some extra training from the end. You just do the same charm plus epsilon, right? <laughs> but I had another question very briefly. Um, the, the striking feature you find for the blue ones um, will tend to go away a little if you go up into this but let's Let's take it at face value that that's initial scale, right? That would, to me, imply that um, the integral or you know, the momentum fraction would be a lot different for those two nuance too, right? Right. right? Which is difficult to digest in the sense that um, the momentum sum will be satisfied, right? Right. And, and then um, I don't think there's a clear mechanism to to get momentum from other places because the up and down distributions are really well constrained and um, I mean, they're really super well constrained from at least 10 to the minus 3 to 1. But you're referring to the balance. That are right. Very well constrained. And, and to see, uh, you know, once you go to then below 10 to the minus 3, you just see. So, the so okay, right. so, okay, here's the C. <laughs> it's pretty widely unconstrained with this blue ratio. Yeah, well, that seems. So, by the time that I have Hera, then this stuff becomes like this, and then this stabilizes way more. Yeah, so I, yeah. see, I think that there is a comp I mean there is a clear compensation to make sure the sample holds. Mm -hmm. Now the claim that you can actually get PDF without a sample seems to me very difficult to believe because people think that oh, no, 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 all the fits tend to actually satisfy the sample. I think that what they mean is that they do a fit, 
get here, remove the sunblock. Well, that's still the same thing, right? But if you start from everywhere and collect, you know, and not import the sunblock, I think you will get nonsense. So, yeah. It seems kind of like you, you end up with, well, you start with presumably a very large and larger than what is shown, normal fits, but then you seem to have a trifurcation or so of your solutions with the bar, right? That's all that's. Right. After you add draw beyond there, but you almost have another project. So what are the so the first question is what are what are the observable for Diva and Yuba in this small X region? I, I would say none. Just that way. And the only thing that I have handled on Diva and Yuba is just here. Now the fact that I have a bifurcation of this might be just the fact that I'm doing a sampling and I get to maybe three different minimums, and then I'm you know shuffling around this. So that's the spread that you see. But of course, that's why I need to put the actual nested sampling to make sure that I cover very smoothly oh, this, and then I will have a much more smoother uh, uh, example. It's troubling. If I look at it from the way the classified and the path that you're going, actually calculating on the lattice, D bar, U bar, which is very small X, but different is different. There's no mechanism. There. Right. So one of one of the part minus two bar will most be done from the round point one. So in this exercise, one thing that I try to stay away is to make assumptions. You know, I want to see how far the data can tell me without minimal assumptions. But I know so you know the funny thing for instance in CJ is that you create a D bar minus U bar, and then I said, well, how about I remove the well young data? Does the D bar minus U bar go away? No, you stay the same. So the point is that since there are many parameters, you know, really this scan of what is the uncertainty becomes inadequate if you, you know, if you try to impose certain parametric concepts. So I'm trying here to, you know, to give a complementary picture of how to scan all the parameters in a very wide way. This is one way. And of course, if you don't like to have this thing, then we can actually put essentially on a prior to make sure that this behavior doesn't exist. So this, this analysis could become like a baseline, right? With all possible shapes, and then you start feeding in answers. Like, I don't want the other one. Can we look at the, the ratio as far as 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 far as mm -hmm. you want? Know, this with a grain of salt as a spread. Uh, right, on the upper right corner. I'll let you look at larger value. Now, if I integrate it, if I, in other words, if I consider the ratio integrate with Moment, x moment, this moment, and integrate it from the one to the region where um, the u bar, d bar uh, difference start to show up in the point one. That's it. Integrate it uh, to two, zero point one. Then the lattice, I can give you the best lattice calculation. You can get the continuum, everything is controlled, is about one. In other words, the region will be. Flat and pointing, and it drops. So you mean here? You yeah, mean, yeah, and then it drops a point, comes to point one. So you saw this so far. It's very effective for it's very, very well. So I <coughs> have lost all our coffee break. Which <laughs> <laughs> means also all the cookies. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, I wanted to suggest that uh, we come to the end. You didn't show your last slide, so you should show us your conclusion exactly. for sure. Everyone did this, so I'm going to do that. Here is it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I wanted to suggest that if there are more questions, we go and ask them in the coffee break, or if there's some burning one, we ask them now. Any burning question? And it goes down to 10 to minus 3 for the delta G to uh, 10 to minus 3. That's are, you, are you talking about the, 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 the moment or? Yeah, this, yeah. Uh, this one. So, so yes. if you're going to, already going to the 10 to minus 3, yeah. and you're getting a very choppy one. So, so does this mean, does mean that you don't need a ESC? No, 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 no. no. Again, I got one single fit and move a little bit this. Okay. 
which means I got one single fit and move a little bit here. And this was how much I can change the glue, the polarize. But I, can, I haven't shown you whether or not the picture is much broader. That's what I'm trying to say. So preliminary. You know, even you can see how crazy is the situation if I actually try to do the full sports scan. So, I mean, I haven't finished, but you know, the next rows will be DIS plus polarized and see how the priors for the glue will be, you know, crazy. Probably it's going to be really crazy because DSS B has very crazy errors. And I should be able to verify that, right? I mean, and that's why you need EIC. <coughs> Okay, so I suggest we do coffee and we come back 11.15. Okay. Oh, it's the next right. box. And thank uh, Nabu again. <laughs> what, what, nothing. Yes. <laughs>